over here. There we go. Good morning, everybody. Today we are beginning chapter one in the textbook. We have completed the preliminary material on method of sections and method of joints. So this is lecture number six, covering or beginning to cover chapter one. Um, now we're going to be spending one or two weeks on chapter one and the pattern will be the same where I'll have a homework assignment due at the end of chapter one, which will be your second homework assignment because your first homework assignment is due Monday on the preliminary material. But we won't have an in-class exam until right before midterms. And the midterm exam will cover uh, chapters one through four in the textbook plus the preliminary material. And it'll be right before spring break. If I can schedule it properly and make everything work out the way it should, the exam will be the Friday before spring break. So if any of you are going to be, I hope you're not going to be traveling that day, but if you are going to be traveling that day, uh, you can make arrangements to take it with me the Thursday before or the Wednesday before after class. Um, but that's kind of the plan. So our spring break, we don't have spring break. This is the wrong semester. We, I'm sorry, we're still in the fall. So it'll be at midterm, which is in uh, the end of October. We don't really, I, think, I don't even think we have a three-day weekend anymore. I don't think so. Isn't that weird? Maybe we'll just have to, I'll just have to call it. The semester is 16 weeks long, so it'll be at the end of the eighth week is what it amounts to. So, um, yeah, Dad Gummit, I was hoping for spring already. I was already thinking it was spring, so. Uh, anyway, so like right now, this is actually, this is two and a half weeks, three and a half, four and a half, five and a half, six and a half, uh, seven and a half, eight and a half. So it'll be around October 19th, which is, yeah, that's approximately when we'll have it, October 19th or October 22nd, perhaps. So that'll be the, that'll be the deal. All right. Um, and then, of course, we've talked about how much things are worth and so forth. All right. So let's talk about chapter one. And in chapter one, we are going to talk a little bit more. We're going to just build on the material that we've already had. And we're going to be talking about a concept called stress. Now, the first thing that I want to alert you to is the fact that the word stress scientifically means something very specific. It's a force exerted over an area. All right, we're going to discuss this. We're going to break this down so that you know what there are different kinds of stress and so forth. In everyday life, sometimes we use the term stress to mean that you know you're stressed out or whatever, and or we even use the term stress the same as strain. Like somebody's under a lot of stress, somebody's under a lot of strain. Uh, in mechanics of materials, those two things are not equal to each other, and they are absolutely. Uh, two scientific terms. Stress is a force over an area and strain is a change in a length or an angle based on an applied or a, or a responsive load. And the way we would write that is that it's a D over L or a uh, phi over gamma, I guess it would be. All right, some angle over some other angle. So in other words, strain is dimensionless. And we'll talk about strain later. We're not going to talk about strain right now. I'll give you a short example of it, and then we'll move on from there. And stress is in units of force per area, such as pounds of force per inch squared or um, newtons per meter squared. Pound of force per inch squared is called a PSI. A newton per meter squared is called a Pascal. Okay, and we'll talk more about units on that. So before I leave strain in the dust for now, uh, if we have like a, an iron bar or a bar made out of some material and we apply a force to it and we pull on it and we pull with the responsive force of the same amount so that it stays still, um, depending on the material that this is made out of, what do you think will happen to this bar? Will it move? No. That's why we, it will elongate. All right? Um, if we push on it, 
with some force, what do you think will happen? It will shorten, okay? So in other words, this change in length is referred to as del. The change in length is referred to as del. And strain, which is given the Greek letter epsilon, in this sense is del over L. That's referred to as a normal strain, where L is the original length of the bar, okay? Now, the other way it can, we can do is if we have an angular deformation. So if you have a rectangle of material, a little rectangular prism of material, and you push on it this way and this way, and then to keep it from rotating, you push on it this way and this way. So in other words, you have two equal and opposite moments. Um, you can have it deform. This is greatly exaggerated, but it will deform into something where the angles of this were formerly 90 degrees, and now they are different than 90 degrees. So in this case, that angular deformation, the change in the angle, um, is equal to a different kind of a strain. Okay, And uh, this is referred to as normal strain. And this is referred to as shearing strain. And once again, we're going to define those terms exactly today. today. We're going to talk about normal stress specifically. So we have four different things that we've sort of talked about. We've talked about uh, stress, and we've talked about uh, strain. And we can have a normal stress and a normal strain. Which have to do with elongations and forces, unresponsive uh, loads that exerted on an area that is normal or perpendicular to the applied load. And we can also have a shearing stress and a shearing strain, which has to do with loads that are applied not perpendicular to a surface but parallel to a surface that they act upon. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, normal stress only. All right, now this builds directly on what we did in our preliminary work with uh, the method of joints and the method of sections. But normal stress is designated using the Greek letter sigma. And sigma is equal to a force that is perpendicular to an area over the area itself. And normal stress, if it's positive, is a tension or tensile stress. And if it's negative, is compression or compressive stress. So the types of responses that we were seeing in terms of force in the structural members of trusses are all normal stresses. In other words, the force was if this is member AB, if we look at AB, the force is either directed this way or directed this way. And if it's pulling on the joints, it's tension. And if it is pushing on the joints, it's in compression. Now in a truss, everything is static. And we do have a little bit of give or change in um, length. I think I have a couple of pictures here. I tried to, I think I posted these, but let's find out. Uh, get rid of you. I did. Okay, so these pictures are pictures of the Willwood Bridge, which is south of town. Um, this is actually, uh, that's just such a beautiful bridge, but this is the Willwood Dam. 
right here and then going over it is this trestle bridge. You can see that the trestles are perfect triangles. It's a Warren truss, a very traditional old school kind of a, of a bridge truss. And you can see that the purpose of it is to elevate the roadbed above the dam, which is a darn good idea. Uh, so let's take a look at um, the other picture that I posted, which is the expansion joint. Now this is just, I just pulled over. This is not on the bridge itself. This is on the road that is kind of to the south east, southwest of the, um, of the bridge. But you can see here that there is um, like a, a road bar in there and then these connected. And that's because that bridge is going to expand and contract a little bit. Um, so, and this has, this, this bridge, I didn't take any pictures of this bridge because it's not quite as exciting as the, as the one going over the dam, which is actually barred from, um, from vehicle traffic right now. But anyway, so that expansion joint is just kind of that expansion that we're talking about. So, we can have it uh, pushing on the joint or pulling on the joint, and it can either be intention or compression. Now, why do we not just care about the force? In the last one, when we were talking about the method of joints and the method of sections, we discussed tension or compression just in terms of a force. So we talked about the number of pounds or the number of kips, or we could have talked about the number of um, newtons that was being borne by a particular structural member. Well, when we talk about the internal response, the force is not the only thing that's important. Internal response in terms of force is not the only consideration. And this gets into the idea of design. So if you have a very large load, say I was building a bridge right now, okay, why would I not want to build my bridge out of paper, would you say? Well, what happens if I push on paper? That is exactly correct. So this is your clue that paper is not a good bridge building material. So what might I do if I wanted to build a bridge instead of building it out of paper? I might want to build it out of steel, wood, right? Has anyone, yes, yes, sir. Perfect. That's exactly correct, which is um, a Newton per square meter is called a Pascal, which is exactly correct. That's exactly, you're, you're two steps ahead of me, which is super, absolutely super. So, um, so yeah, so what can you do if you have, let's go back to this equation, and if you have a force per area, and you're building a bridge, and the force is just what the force is, that's going to be the cars that drive over it, you know, um, the people that walk over it or whatever. You can't really say, I mean, you can put a load restriction on a bridge, right? You see those signs all the time. But what can you do, except if you can't significantly change the load, what else can you change? You can. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. So, in other words, you can make it bigger. You can make the material larger. So, if a toothpick isn't big enough to build your bridge, and all you have is wood, you can get a timber, right? You can get a two by four, four by four. If a two by four isn't big enough, you can get a two by six, right? You can do these sort of things. Now the next thing that you can do, of course, is maybe wood isn't strong enough, or maybe you don't want to have a big hulking, you know, 80, I mean, just this big, incredibly um, stout bridge. You want to have something more slender. So at that point, you need to build the bridge out of something that is, uh, that has more internal strength. It's able to bear more tension or compression, okay? And this is extremely well studied. The idea of what materials will bear before they start to either uh, deform or break and how they deform or break uh, is, is something that we'll talk about, we'll touch lightly on here. It's actually an introduction to this idea, but it's something that we study 
intensely because um, in your in your professional life, you never want to be responsible for a failure, right? Failures, I mean, failure in terms of personal failure is not that big of a deal. Failure in terms of erecting a structure that fails, that's a, you, know, that you, you want to do everything you can to avoid that. Have you guys ever seen the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which blew up? Um, okay, I'll show it to you really quickly. There's like, this is all over the place. This is like, there's, a, oh, I'll, maybe I could find another one too. But since we're talking about bridges, we'll do this. Um, so the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was a bridge that was built over Puget Sound, which is in Washington State, back in the early 1940s. And it was built, it wasn't really, this is an interesting thing to say, it was not a design uh, problem, or it was a design problem, but it was more or less, it wasn't an engineering problem. All of the engineering on this bridge was done correctly, uh, but there were some new things that came into, um, I'm gonna do, yeah, here we go. It, there were some new factors that came into uh, designs based on the narrowness of this bridge that we had to, that we were not taking into account. I don't think I can get the sound up on this. So look at the center span of the bridge. This is what I want to draw your attention to. Every time that the wind would blow a certain way, the center span would just start to vibrate. And what they later found out was what was really happening was the pulsating wind, it wasn't even high wind, it was like moderately high wind that was pulsating. It was actually set up for a long time. So that's The other thing, um, and, and the center span, the only way to review this is to upload. Now, one thing I'd like to look at, look at that center line. The center line stays closer to the In other words, the bridge was rotating um, around the center span, more or less. I don't know why it did that. There we go. And so, if you look at the sides uh, where everything's hung from, and you look at the, the roadway, I mean, it is just going to heck all over the place. And they called this bridge, um, the nickname for it was Galloping Gertie, and people wouldn't drive across it. It was like an hour to go around, and a lot of people were so superstitious about it that they wouldn't even drive across it under any circumstance. So anyway, uh, this was a, a bridge design that did not account for all of the things that were happening. And one of the things, the, the real failure of this bridge came about from the fact that it was so slender compared to previous bridges. Bridges built up to this point were built sort of on what I like to call a castle model, where everything's built out of brick and mortar and everything's just really strong and stout and everything is designed to uh, hold stress due to a structural integrity. This was one of the first suspension bridges that was built that was very slender. And if you look on the side here, the sides of the center span were actually I-beams. And we'll learn a little bit about I-beams too, but I-beams have a cross-section that looks like an I, and they um, allow less mass. They're much less heavy than a rectangular um, thing, and yet because of where the flanges are, they have almost as much resistance as twist. But these I-beams did not, this poor guy, he didn't get hurt by the way, but um, he, the, uh, the I-beams now you'll see a lot of times when they build bridges, they'll have holes in them. They'll have like just the the I mean, they build holes in them, and that's to keep that pulsating wind from the bridge solid, but break the wind kind of thing. Actually, you know, it looks like a really good bridge, a lot stronger than the design. But in the 1940s, people did not understand this. Engineers did not understand this. That's really strong bridge. But this bridge is actually what um, caused him. Yeah, that's called a harmonic resonance, and when and it just happens. 
pretty much time before you can just rip stuff apart. And those of you that are going to be doing that for years will study a ton and all the time for vibration. I mean, vibration just has so much energy in the field when you start all these things. And everything starts moving in the same direction like that. And it can be good to get those resonant frequencies like when you're playing an instrument, especially a string instrument, or you can get this. So, uh, yeah, so you want to make sure you, you don't want it to happen unless you plan for it to happen. But, uh, yeah, isn't that cool? And the good news is no human beings were hurt. Um, there was a dog in the car that went into the Puget Sound. The, the dog was killed, but at least the human population was also killed. There's also been people that have been killed by all the things that have been killed. They did eat So, anyway, so these are some of the ideas that we have. Now, this bridge, if they would have built uh, this bridge on an old-fashioned design, a stouter design, this wouldn't have happened. In other words, it was just acting like a guitar string. It was so, just so slender. And there are some interesting effects that occur when something is much longer than it is wide. There are some exacerbated effects uh, called col column effects. But in general, um, this was a this was a failure in terms of a public work, but there was a lot of good information that came out of it. And now we know how to design bridges like this. Okay. Anyway, so let me get back to the document camp, and we'll talk a little bit about what's going on here. So, so as um, Christian pointed out, uh, normal stress. We are talking about a force over an area. It can either be a tensile uh, stress or it can be a compressive stress. And when we analyze a truss or we analyze a structural member to determine, uh, we already have almost all of, we have almost all of this information already. Now, if you have a structural member, like let's just use AB as an example since I've already drawn it. If you think about it, whether it's part of a truss or it's a standalone structural member, and I'm drawing this a little bit differently. Now I'm talking about AB, so I'm pulling on AB. So the force here is uh, tension. In other words, it, it, the drawing is a little bit different. In other words, I'm pulling this apart so that AB would tend to elongate. And so AB is in tension. In normal stress, or axial stress, sometimes it's called because the, the loads are directed along the axis, meaning the longer part, the longer measurement. Um, elongation is, or a tendency toward elongation is associated with tension and a tendency toward uh, shortening is associated with compression, generally speaking. But if you were to take this structural element, say it was a cylindrical shape, and pull on it, and we always talk about the load and axial load, we generally call it P, and the responsive load that keeps it from moving as being P prime. So this could be anchored somewhere, or um, like in our, in our structural members, we're anchored at the joints. But basically, if you think about the distribution of stress, um, you know that it's going to be a little bit, there's a little bit more pull right here and a little bit less pull right here uh, as you get further away from the applied load. So when the, the relationship is, it's sort of a parabolic thing where right in the vicinity of the applied load, there's, a, there's more stress than there is a little bit farther away. So what we're really looking at is an average, okay? So to find a sigma average, it's going to be approximately equal to the magnitude of that load divided by the cross-sectional area, but understanding that in the, in the immediate vicinity of the applied load, it's gonna be a little bit higher, right? So today, this is what we're gonna talk about. So this is kind of a deceptively easy, um, equation because although we can use this, it really turns out that sigma, if we're not talking about an average, is a limit. So of course we have a little bit of calculus going on there. We're not going to do this, 
um, just to let you know, but as the area approaches uh, zero of the change in the force over the change in the area. So this is the exact equation. This is the approximate equation which we'll use um, for this particular uh, for this particular set of ideas. All right. So, like we talked about, I'm going to make a distinction between two different terms, between dimensions and units. Dimensions are physical properties. such as force and length. There's a lot of other ones, you know, uh, mass and um, distance. I guess length is distance. Uh, amps, lumens, uh, surface tension units and so forth. But basically these are the physical properties and units um, are used to measure physical properties. So this is where we get into the idea of what we call in the United States, the US customary system, which is not really a system at all, we'll talk about it in a minute, and also the metric or SI system. Okay. Now, and my apologies to everyone, you, you people from America and people from elsewhere, uh, because it's my opinion that the metric system is better. Uh, however, we, since America, since the United States uses something different, everyone in the world has to use both of them. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very perplexing situation. But basically, there are only three countries in the world, three organized governments, that have not committed to using the SI system. And those countries are the United States, Liberia in Africa, and Myanmar, which is the country formerly known as Burma. And uh, Liberia, I think, actually, they were toying with the idea of signing an accord to use the metric system, and they mostly use the metric system. So I think it's just us and Burma. Well, <laughs> I know. Burma has, or it's not, I'm sorry, Myanmar. So, oh hi, we, oh, we'll be out in about 10 minutes. Um, so Burma actually is uh, a little country, it's not little, but it's a country in, in Asia, and they're a major exporter, world exporter of teak wood, which is a waterproof wood that people use in boats, boat decks, and sometimes in uh, decks in their home. And teak wood is measured in, the closest analogy I can give you is like a board foot, but they basically measure the diameter of the teak wood uh, log and then the length and there's a bonus for larger diameter logs because you can cut bigger things out of them so it's it so that's the kind of unit that they use for their exporting business um, in the United States we export and import everything so if any of you for example have ever worked on a car even if your car even if your car is from Detroit or Kentucky uh, you probably would have to have two sets of tools to do that, an SAE, which is Standard Automotive Engineering, and metric. So, yes? So why don't they switch it? We have tried, and we're just stubborn. So we're Americans, and we so do what we feel all like. all of your engineers have to learn both? Yes. So yes. All, Ameri so all the engineers know how to easily transfer over. Yes. Well, there have been major mistakes based on transferring over incorrectly. Um, so this is another, so, so I wouldn't go so far as to say we can all do it easily, but I really drill it, I really drill this um, because I think it's an important skill. And I actually have a collection of accidents that have occurred due to unit conversion problems from SI to metric. So I have two more minutes and I'll tell you about one of them, okay? Uh, one of them, one of my personal favorites was a big humongous airplane in Canada that actually ran out of fuel. And the reason was, uh, now, and you know, if you've ever flown commercially, which I'm sure most of you have, um, 
they're really careful. The chances of dying in a commercial airplane accident are very, 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 very small because they use a protocol that's basically called a fail-safe, which means if everything falls apart, they have five or six backups so that if one thing falls apart, another thing will take over and so forth. So um, the thing that actually saved this airplane and saved the people, this is referred to as the Gimli glider, uh, this was what happened was this was back in the 70s or 80s and uh, there was an airplane it was a newly minted airplane and the fuel capacity was stated in liters and before that fuel capacity in the United States was measured in short tons which is 2,000 pounds so liter is a measure of volume and um, Tons is a measure of either weight or mass. It's really a measure of weight, so we use it more to denote mass. And there is an incorrect conversion. There are 2.2 kilograms, excuse me, 2.2 pounds per kilogram, but instead of multiplying the need for fuel by 2.2, they divided the need for fuel by 2.2, so they ended up with less than one fourth of the fuel on board the airplane that they needed. And this was checked by the pilot and the flight engineer and the maintenance guys and everybody else. So there's a conversion problem. So a plane gets up in the air, has a great, the guy, the, the, the fail safe that actually worked on this one was the pilot himself, uh, but he ran out of fuel. And his engines were shutting down, his hydraulics were shutting down. And I don't really even know at that point if he knew what was happening, but he realized that he was in big trouble and he wasn't gonna make the next airport. So we had the flight engineer, the flight engineer found a little abandoned runway uh, that was very near them, and so he flew to that. And at the same time, in addition to not having any fuel, he was gliding at this time, his engines were dead, and he was just floating, you know? So uh, at the same time, uh, all of the hydraulics, um, the hydraulic assist required fuel, so that all went out. So he was like muscling this entire plane in just with his physical strength. So he found this abandoned airstrip, and he realized that he was too high coming in. And so what he needed to do, he did an unauthorized maneuver, which is called a side slip. So he actually turned his wings to, do, to tilt one way. This is something he'd do in like Cessnas. And turned his uh, rudder to, to do the other way. And the plane will just actually lose altitude. It doesn't fall, but it just loses altitude much more quickly. And that's called a, a side slip. So he did a side slip. And just as he was about to land on the, the runway, was very short, by the way. I mean, very, very way too short for this airplane. Um, there was actually a picnic. There was a group of people having a picnic on the runway. And a little kid was riding his bike up and down the runway. And he just happened to see this plane <laughs> coming in. And he yelled and everybody got off the runway and the plane landed. But it was so heavy and so fast that it rolled up the, the runway, the, the material underneath it. It just it completely rolled up the runway. And then the nose gear caught fire because of all the friction. So the pilot, after landing the plane safely, gets out with a fire extinguisher and puts out the nose gear and everything's fine. So in order to get it back up off the runway, they had to rebuild the runway, right? And then um, they had to take out everything in the airplane, including the seats. And then they had, I don't know if it was the same pilot, but they had to have a very experienced pilot take off on that short runway. So. So there you go, there's the story of the Gimli Glider. And the whole thing, I mean, when they went back through it, they're just like, I have no idea what happened. Because you divided by four instead of multiplying, or divided by two instead of multiplying by two. So. He's gonna gas me. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, they, they, they had a different plane, and they didn't, they might have had a gas meter, or it's a fuel meter, but um, they weren't using it, because airplanes do not fly with full fuel, because it's expensive. It's heavy, and the more weight you have on an aircraft, the more it costs. So you want your weight to be in luggage and people. You don't want to waste it on extra fuel. So everybody has enough fuel to make the next airport, which is another part of the fail safe. But like if you're going to fly into Cody, it depends on where, you're, where your alternative airport is. You might have to go to Great Falls. You might have to go to Billings. You might have to go to Salt Lake. So they have to have enough fuel to get you to the next commercial airport, you know. Um, or if you end up in a, in a holding pattern or whatever. But anyway, so that's why units are important.
How's that sound? That's the end of that lecture. Okay, so uh, you've got your homework for Monday. We've started talking about uh, we've started talking about tension and compression in terms of stress. Started talking about the units. On Monday, we're going to come back and we're going to uh, continue that discussion and talk about uh, sharing stress as well. So have a great weekend, and I will be answering my email. If you have any trouble with your homework, let me know. And have a great weekend. And see.